This afternoon, brothers and sisters, I may proclaim to you the, the instruction coming from God as it is, comes to us in the third commandment of God's holy law. And this afternoon, we will look at one particular aspect of this commandment as the Catechism refers to that in Lord's Day 37. So we'll look at Lord's Day 37. That's on page 554 of your book of prayers. So again, it is an extension of the what we confessed in Lord's Day 36 about the uh, third commandment. Uh, question 101. But may we swear an oath by the name of God in a godly manner? Yes, when the government demands it of its subjects or when necessity requires it, in order to maintain and promote fidelity and truth to God's glory and for our neighbor's good. Such oath-taking is based on God's word and was therefore rightly used by saints in the Old and the New Testament. And 102, may we also swear by saints or other creatures? No. A lawful oath is a calling upon God, who alone knows the heart, to bear witness to the truth and to punish me if I swear falsely. No creature is worthy of such honor. So far, this is a part of our confession. In uh, response to the preaching, we will sing Psalm 66, verse 1 and 2. Immediately after the proclamation, Psalm 66, 1 and 2. The congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, do you, uh, do you ever look at the small change that you have somewhere in your pocket and that goes through your fingers every day? The coins, I mean, you use, you buy a coffee or pay for parking or something like that. Do you know what they look like? On the one side, you see different pictures. You get a loon, you get a polar bear, you get a beaver. On the other side, they're all the same. You see a portrait of the queen with the words Elizabeth II. D. G. Regina. It has nothing to do with the capital city of uh, Saskatchewan. It's Latin. And it means Deo gratia regina. Well, that's the way you put it in Latin. In English, it means Elizabeth II, Queen by the grace of God. Indeed. Every Canadian carries in his pocket the public acknowledgement of the Almighty God as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Ruler Supreme. Because that's what it is. And this is the same country where there's more and more official policy to erase any form of religion from the public square. After all, we are a secular society and we make a strict separation between church and state. And for many folks, that's the same as a separation between faith and other areas in life. Appealing to the Bible as the way to distinguish between right and wrong does not carry any weight in our public society. It's actually on its way to become a crime. Some of you may have heard the name of this member of parliament in Finland. There's a lady whose name I won't able, be able to pronounce. Now you may have heard that she was in court this week in Finland, standing trial for what? She was standing on trial for quoting on Twitter what the Bible teaches about human sexuality. It's called hate speech. It's quoting scripture. It's called hate speech, and it could land her in jail for two years. The fear for faith in public society goes so far, it's almost absurd sometimes. Just wait for the MP who is going to make a motion to get rid of the D and the G on your coins. 
or to remove from our national anthem the, 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 the line, ruler supreme who hears humble prayer. Although that the, the, the latter may not happen, because outside the Reformed circles, that second stanza is hardly known anyway. Now, all those things beg the question, what is or what should be the role of God in our public society? It's true. In our courts and at other occasions, like swearing in a new government, you can still swear an oath by calling upon the name of God. Although people can swear an oath today, according to all the different religions and traditions that you will find in our country. That triggers even more questions about the place of the true and living God in our modern society. Well, that is what your confession is dealing with on Lord's Day 37 when it talks about swearing an oath. Swearing an oath as a specific application of using God's name in public. The Lord claims the acknowledgement of his authority. That's the message this afternoon. We look at the third commandment, and the Lord claims that we acknowledge his authority. Congregation, we are still dealing with the third commandment of God's law. All the other commandments are dealt with in one Lord's Day, but for the third commandment, it's the only one, we have two Lord's Days, 36 and 37. Why is that? Why does the Catechism give separate attention to this topic of swearing an oath? I mean, true, you, when you swear an oath, you call upon God's holy name, and that's relevant for the third commandment. It's about God's name. But let's be realistic. How often do you do that in your day-to-day -day life, swearing an oath? Not too often, I guess. So to find out why the authors of the Catechism thought it was important to focus on that, we have to go back in the to the time of the Reformation. Reformers like Martin Luther and John Calvin were not only facing the conflict with the Roman Catholics, so that gets the most attention in the history books, but that was not the only thing. They were also confronted with two other groups, with humanistic influences, and at the same time with the radical movement of the Anabaptists. Now, the humanists claim that we don't need God in our public society. Yes, it's okay if you want to be a Christian, but you have to keep it private. In a public square, referring to God or to the Word of God is not necessary. It doesn't contribute anything. When we are dealing with social issues or political issues or educational issues, whatever else, our rational human wisdom should be sufficient. That's the humanist approach. Rational human wisdom. Now, the other group, the Anabaptists, claim that God does not want to have anything to do with our wicked society. So it's a bit of a different approach. The Anabaptists would say that the world is ruled by the devil and God is holy, and so are God's people. And so they make this absolute separation between the kingdom of heaven under God's government and the kingdom of the world under Satan's government. So when you have accepted Jesus as your king, they said, you have become citizens of God's kingdom. And when you're a citizen of God's kingdom, you have nothing to do with the kingdoms of this world anymore. No earthly rulers. The holy and almighty God has nothing to do with what's going on in this corrupt world, which is still in the power of sin. And neither have you, as Christian believer. You've been saved out of this sinful world. And therefore, don't swear an oath. Not at all. Don't use God's holy name to confirm the truth in a world that is ruled by the biggest liar ever. That's the devil. Did Jesus not say, don't swear, but let your yes be yes and your no be no? Now, there are, of course, some major differences between the rational humanists 
and radical Anabaptists, but both groups have in common that, and it's for different reasons, but they do not want God to be present and mentioned in public society. They think it is wrong to connect God's holy name with what's going on in this world. Well, is that not remarkably similar to the anti-religious feelings we run into in our time? For some, the Bible is a book full of hate speech. Others are a bit more tolerant. They will say, yeah, you want to be a confessing Christian? That's fine, go for it. But leave it at home. Leave it at home when you go to your science lab or when you go to school or when you do business or politics or when you go to court, when you talk about social issues or moral issues, whatever else is going on. So what do we do with that as Christians, Christian church? Now, we could try the Anabaptist approach, right? You can circle the wagons around our Christian territory, separate ourselves from the world, we can try to protect ourselves to avoid interaction with this evil world. You know what the problem is with avoiding interaction with the evil world? Most of you need to go, most of you need to go back to work tomorrow. And not everyone works exclusively with fellow Christians. Now, the result of, 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 of that combination can easily come to lead to some sort of double life. You maintain your Christian standards in your personal life and in your family and on Sundays, but you leave all that behind and you rely on rational human thinking when you go out to do what you have to do in our world, a secular world, a secular environment. But that means that in both scenarios, you accept the idea of two separate territories. And let's face it, that's often how it feels, right? You have God's territory, and you have Satan's territory. You have the church, you get the bad world. Two kingdoms with each his own set of standards to live by. And how do you manipulate that, and manage that, and juggle that? Well, that is exactly what your confession is concerned with in Lord's Day 37. With the matter of swearing an oath, there is only one issue. But swearing an oath with the name of God is the starting point for Lord's Day 37 to reflect the conviction that there are not two territories in this world that are ruled by two different sets of standards. It is God's glory, and we, we, we have seen that in Lord's Day 36, right? It is God's glory that we use His holy name, and we do so with fear and reverence. We confess Him, we call upon Him, and we praise Him at all times and in all circumstances. And that implies that throughout, throughout this world, we are called to honor his name publicly and that we openly acknowledge and proclaim his authority everywhere in this world, even in what seems to be Satan's territory. As Christian believers, don't accept this popular idea that your faith and the Bible are not relevant for public life in our society. Or don't accept the idea that what God says in his word is not relevant for academics or for politics or for business or for human rights. The Bible makes very clear that nothing is beyond the realm of God's authority. By speaking about swearing an oath by God's name to maintain fidelity and truth in our society, Lord's Day 37 protests against this separation. God Almighty is the creator, and he's the owner of all things everywhere, despite Satan's power. The holy God claims his right to be publicly acknowledged 
in his authority as king over all the nations and over all the people on the earth and in everything that happens. Think of Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Or think of Psalm 103. The Lord established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. God's royal authority covers the whole world, whether people are willing to acknowledge it or not, or whether people are willing to submit to it or not. In other words, there is no area in life where God's authority is not relevant. There is no area in life that God does not claim for himself. That's amazing. But it's not only amazing, it's more than that. It's also encouraging. Because it means that as God's children, you can go public everywhere and you can claim God's authority over everything as it is present in this world. To the glory of God and for the good of your neighbor. That's actually an answer 101. Now, sure, that may get you into trouble. Into trouble with people who claim the opposite. They may tell you that the God you believe in is just the result of your own imagination. And if you believe in a God who is the result of your own imagination and it makes you feel good, that's fine. But it has nothing to do with what's happening in the real world. It has no impact on our society whatsoever. But you know, people may think about God what they feel like. People may say about God what they feel like. It does not change who God is. It does not change what God's rights are. And, and that is also the glorious stone in the psalm we have read, Psalm 96. Psalm 96, it's a beautiful song. It's all about the glory and the strength of the Lord. And the Lord who, who, who reigns over the nations, who reigns over the peoples, all the families of the earth, and he does so in great splendor and with awesome majesty. No matter what happens in this world, under the destructive powers of sin and Satan, it is and will always be his world. That's why he sent the son Jesus. God loves his world. God loves his world so much that he sent his one and only son. God loves his creation. And he did not want to give it up after he fell into sin and messed it all up. No, no. He chose to save his creation. He chose to renew it by the power of his Holy Spirit. Why was that? Why did he do that? Because he is the holy God. He's the almighty one. He does not give up his claim. He never will. A long time ago, a long time ago, God destroyed the world in the flood. You know the story in the beginning of Genesis 6 to 8. But it was not total destruction. Not total annihilation. He saved Noah and his family, and he reclaimed his world. Remember what he said to Noah in Genesis 9, verse 13. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, that's an interesting way of putting it, right? God made a covenant with the earth. In verse 16, God calls it an everlasting covenant between him and every living creature on the earth. And today, this same God continues to claim his right to be acknowledged and honored, even in our public society. Acknowledged and honored as the creator and ruler of the world. With that message, with that powerful message, the Church of Jesus Christ is present in our society, our secularized society. The church is called to proclaim that in Jesus Christ, the awesome and almighty God rules over everything, and that he has the right to be acknowledged, that he has the right to be 
honored by everyone. No, that does not sound like a message that will have a promising perspective in this country. I mean, Christians try to be actively engaged in politics, in the public debate about social issues and moral issues, and they don't want to be silent about God's claim as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that's good. That's good that, they, that Christians want to do that. At the same time, as I said before, Canada is basically a secular nation. It's ruled by a secular government. And in our time, this government will more and more use all the means that are possible to erase the public presence of God, the God of the Bible and of His Son, Jesus Christ, let alone the acknowledgement that He has any authority. When you come to think of that, these are difficult questions. Like, should a non-Christian government ask unbelieving citizens to swear an oath by calling upon the Holy God? Right? So you get an, you get an unchristian government, a non-Christian government, you have unbelieving citizens that come to court. Should they use the name of God? Does it make sense? Does such an oath not become sin against the third commandment? Is it not a matter of using God's name in vain? I mean, if you don't believe in a true and living God, you shouldn't mention his name anyway, should you? Would that not make a mockery of using God's name? As it says in, in answer 99, the Lord of 36, we must use the holy name of God only with fear and reverence. Any other use of God's name is blasphemy. And yet, regardless of what people think when they mention God's name in public, this claim of God is never going to change. The holy God insists on it. Even when there is a large majority and a vocal majority in our society that say that they won't have anything to do with the God of the Bible, or with the Word of God, or with the church, let alone are they are ready to submit to God's authority. Well, that is the context in which we are church today. What do we do in this context? Well, in this context, our God calls us, and He keeps calling us, to proclaim His message that He is King. And that we live in this wonderful reality of his kingdom and of his glorious authority. And how popular that is going to be is irrelevant. In his son Jesus Christ, he has committed himself to his world as the glorious king of all the earth. And for that very reason alone, he has the right to be acknowledged as ruler supreme. Think of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Ephesians 1, verse 20 to 21. Christ was raised from the dead and seated at God's right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority, all power and dominion. And just before Jesus left this earth, he said it himself. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Indeed, brothers and sisters, this is your Father's world. And though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. Through Him, kings and presidents and prime ministers govern. They may not believe it, they may not care for it. They may hate the idea. But the Lord continues to claim the public acknowledgement of his royal authority. And he promises, he promises that such public acknowledgement will turn out to be a blessing for our society. And again, many may not believe it. Many may not care for it. Many may hate the idea. But this we must remember. He also warns those 
who refuse to acknowledge his royal authority over everything, he will punish. Do we stand for that as his church? Do you stand for that personally as his children? And does that show in the manner in which you engage with what is going on in our society? And how you respond to all the evil you encounter in this world? And there's a lot of that. Are you prepared to show the glory of God's authority in the way you live? Are you prepared to stand up for God's authority? Lord's Day 37 is about swearing an oath in a godly manner. We can do that because God's authority is not restricted to the church. God's authority is not restricted to spiritual matters. It's not only valid on the Sunday. No, no. It's effective always, everywhere. Also, when you go to work on Monday, when you go to school on Tuesday, or when you go to court on Thursday. Don't split up your life in a Sunday part and a secular part. Always and everywhere, you are a child of your heavenly Father. And always and everywhere, your heavenly Father urges you, be holy because I am holy. That's why your Father expects you to stand up for His name in public, in our society, today. The proper use of the oath to promote and defend the truth is only one example of how you can do that. That's Lord Day 37. But you can easily think of many more occasions and scenarios that give you the opportunity to let the people know that God does have all authority in heaven and on earth. And that challenges each one of us, first of all, to acknowledge God's authority in your own life for yourself. And all the things we are personally involved in as God's children in this world, whether it's education, whatever the Lord calls you, whether it's politics, business, social action, academics, sports, you name it. Are you, driven, are, are, are you driven by a loving respect for who the Almighty God is? Are you committed to stand up for this great and holy name and the saving work of Jesus? It begins in your own life, and it begins actually in the church within the communion of God's people. Because here we are, and we praise and acknowledge God's great and awesome name, and we do that together. So here we live together in the presence of the holy and almighty God. Here we deal with each other as his people. Here we know, and here we are aware of him and his great authority and respect it. That's why in the communion of God's people within the fellowship of faith, we do not need a reminder of God's holy presence all the time. That's what we do by swearing an oath in God's name, like we do that in, 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 in the secular world. Then we use the name of God as a permanent reminder that God is in control. But in the church, we don't need that. In the church... We don't swear such oaths. Among each other as God's children, we do not need the extra assurance. We simply say, I do. That's it. And whenever you say yes or no here, let it indeed be yes or no beyond any doubt. After all, you and I are fully aware that every word we speak, we speak in God's holy presence. All the time. We don't have to convince anybody else outside. Here. Let your word be yes and no carry that kind of integrity and sincerity. That will be sufficient. Is this our hallmark as Christians? Is this how we are known in our communities? Is this our reputation when we run a business? How do people talk about us? As Christians. Yeah, those Christians, you know, those Christians, they talk nice in your face, but behind your back they will cheat you and try to get you. Is that our reputation? Or do they say, you know, 
Whatever those Christians believe, I don't really know, but I've noticed what they say is reliable and dependable. Uh, I, I, I've noticed the Christians I know, they keep their word. You can trust them. This is how Jesus would have it when he says to his children and for his disciples, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Then each word that you say here in the church and each promise you make here will have the strength of that oath. Because here I know that I speak every word with the Holy God as my witness. He knows my heart. That's true for our casual conversations. Never overlook that. Did Jesus not say, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words we will be condemned. Think of that when you open your mouth. So, but it's not only the casual conversations. It becomes really important when you think of the decisive moments when you stand before the Lord with the whole congregation as your witnesses, and you simply declare, I do. So you're not standing in a secular court, but you're here. And once in a while, it is good to remind each other of those oaths and of the implications of these oaths. Many of you have stood at a baptismal font with your newborn baby. And when you were asked to promise to instruct your child in the doctrine of the church and to have him or her instructed therein to the utmost of your power, you said, as father and mother, I do. Do you indeed do that, fathers and mothers in the church? Do you take that serious in your family? Take the series in how you lead your children to Jesus Christ? Do you take the series when you send your son or daughter off to school and take them to church? Many of you have also declared, I do, when you did profession of faith. Maybe last year or five years ago, maybe 40 years ago. You remember those questions? Is it your heartfelt desire to serve God according to this word? to forsake the world and to crucify your old nature, do you firmly resolve to commit your whole life to the Lord's service as a living member of his church? Do you still stand for this today? Are you committed to keep your oath? Perhaps you, you did a profession of faith and you said, I do, only a few years ago. And I know. A lot can happen in your life when you say that when you're 18 or 19 and you get to 24 or 25 or 26 in your life. A lot can happen. But remember those words. And when the storms come in your life, the storms come in your life after you profess your faith, things can get rough. But let not Satan make you look at your profession of faith a few years ago as an empty formality or perhaps as a mistake. Hold on to your Father in heaven. Your Father in heaven loves you with all the things you struggle with. He will keep his promise. What about you? And to those who are married, remember also your I do on your wedding day. You promised to love each other. You swore an oath to be there for each other. And to be faithful to one another in all things you come across for as long as you both shall live. And when you've been married for a number of years, you have experienced how big of a commitment it actually is. As good as Christians, they will remind each other of this, I do. Satan is powerful. Marriage is under heavy attack in our society. Sometimes it breaks. Sometimes it's beyond repair. But husbands and wives, let this holy I do that you spoke before the ears of God and many witnesses, let this oath give you the strong support that you need to hold on to one another and to submit to one another in Jesus Christ, especially when your marriage relationship is facing a crisis. Now, finally, some of us have also said I do 
when they were ordained as office bearers. Brothers, elders, deacons, are you faithfully doing what God calls you to do according to what you have promised or according to your oath? Never forget who called you. Never forget, brothers, that this is not your congregation. But the holy God, the great shepherd, he claims his congregation as his own. So let the brothers, the sisters, the children, all the sheep and all the lambs, let them know to whom they belong, the old and the young, the married and the single, the sick and the healthy, the rich and the poor. Help each and every one of them to acknowledge more and more the great authority of God's holy name in their lives. Why is that? Well, the holy God, he allows us to use his name. He allows us to trust in his name. And he calls us to acknowledge his authority. And then he will also enable us to stand up for the truth. To stand up for the truth and defend the truth in a world that is full of lies. And in doing so, he shows that he continues to claim for himself the world he has made. He did not abandon it, and he never will. His glorious kingdom is coming. So praise the ruler supreme who reigns forever and ever. Amen.